Angus Stewart of the Covenant Protestant Reformed Church in Northern Ireland. And I'm joined by Professor Herman Hinko. We're both at the Lorne House in County Down, Northern Ireland. We're having a conference sponsored by the British Reformed Fellowship. And it's going very well. Wouldn't you say so, Prof? The conference is excellent. Well, we want to talk especially this afternoon about Professor Henko's most recent book by the Reformed Free Publishing Association, Justified Unto Liberty, a commentary on Galatians. Now, Professor Henko, you mentioned in your introduction Martin Luther's relationship with this book of Galatians. Would you care to explain that a little further for us? Luther's commentary on Galatians was probably the first major work of Luther that I read. And I did that because I had run across a quote from Luther to the effect, this is not exact, but to the effect that if all the books he had written were burned, there were only two that he would want to Keep. One was the bondage of the will, and the other one was his commentary on Galatians. And I thought to myself, if he esteemed that book so highly, he being the great man that he was, must have written something that I have to read. Very good. I remember something by uh, John Bunyan, who said that Luther and Galatians was a great book for a troubled conscience. Luther would have liked that too. He would have. He certainly would have. Having gone through the experiences with the struggle of his own conscience in the monastery, he certainly would have appreciated that. Now, why do you feel that the book of Galatians is so important today out of the 66 canonical works? Other than the book of Romans, the book of Galatians is most clear and most emphatic on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And in the ecclesiastical circles in which I move, Reformed and Presbyterian churches, the great threat at the present time is a commitment to the heresy of the federal vision which teaches that justification is by faith and works, almost in the same sense in which Rome taught it during the days of Luther and prior to the Reformation. I think it's essential that, once again, the Church underscore the great towering doctrines of justification by faith alone. I see you included the word justification, or a form of it rather, in your title, Justified Unto Liberty, a commentary on Galatians. Now, Justified Unto Liberty, what's the idea there in connection with Galatians? When I was facing the question of a title for the book, I, I wanted a title that was different from commentary on Galatians. I was struggling to express the main driving force of the book. And strangely, my first idea as to a title was the Charter of Christian Liberty, because the role of Christian liberty as rooted in justification is a major role, major theme in the book, especially from chapter 5 on. But that title left the whole idea of justification out. And it certainly would spoil the appeal which the book might have to those who are doing battle with the denial of justification by faith alone. And so I thought about justified by faith alone as the title. But then there was nothing in the title that 
underscored that major theme, liberty, Christian liberty. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. That's the conclusion to Luther's entire doctrinal section, if I may call it that. And so I decided with consul, uh, in consultation with my uh, copy editor to call it Justification Unto Liberty. Next mention of two major themes, justification and Christian liberty. What other main topics do we confront in the book of Galatians and therefore in your commentary? The interesting part of it is, and that's why the epistle of Paul to the Galatians is so important that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is interwoven with the doctrine of the covenant. And especially in chapter 3, that whole idea of the covenant is developed. And the doctrine of justification is made to bear on the doctrine of the covenant. And powerfully in chapter 3 of the book, the idea of an unconditional covenant is underscored. And of course, as you know, justification by faith and works requires of necessity a conditional covenant, or even vice versa, a conditional covenant to which so many hold requires justification by faith and works. Now, how would you envisage this book um, to be used by people? I think probably my primary purpose was after, of course, a defense of the faith on the basis of the themes in Galatians, to provide a running commentary on what I consider to be a most important book in the New Testament that could be used for the purposes of meditation. My primary goal was not to prepare a commentary that one could consult from time to time if he was led to a passage in Galatians which he did not completely understand. My goal was to write a commentary that people could pick up and use for their devotions, in their family devotions or in their personal devotions, and read it from cover to cover. The book is not intended to be merely exegetical, nor is it intended to be merely doctrinal. It is intended to be devotional because it is my conviction that proper biblical devotion is rooted in sound doctrine and straightforward excellence. Martin Luther would have appreciated that too. I think he would have agreed. I think he would have. He was very much concerned about the devotional life. Yes. I would say personally that your purposes have been fulfilled in that for me and my wife I read this book from cover to cover in connection with our family devotions each day. I found it very moving. It helped me a great deal with the book. Then there were some passages which even moved me to preach on parts of Galatians, like the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit in Galatians uh, chapter 5. Now you mentioned to me earlier, Professor, that you most enjoyed writing this particular book. Why is that? My first love in all my studies over the years seminary onward has been exegesis. I taught church history, as you know, for years and years in the seminary. I taught hermeneutics and various other subjects. But there is simply no question in my own mind study, dig into I often think of 
exegesis as comparable to diving into a deep pool of water, which would which deep pool would be the text, and then fighting your way to the surface, and coming up with what the text is all about. What is the word of God to us in this text? You preach regularly in the, in the churches. Is there any connection between this commentary and sermons? Did you preach at all on Galatians as you were working on this book? I am given the privilege of the Lord at present to preach every Sunday night in the congregation of which I am a member. We are without our own pastor. So that gave me an opportunity to do some serious preaching, which I pre prefer. And because I had started on a commentary on Galatians, I thought it would be ideal to write the commentary and preach on it at the same time. It's quite an amazing thing that when you study a book in your study, and when you get up on the pulpit and preach on it, you have two different things. And I think it was the fact that I was preaching on it which gave the commentary its devotional aspect. It is not and was not intended to be academic. And I think that preaching on it as I worked on it assisted in avoiding that. As I understand it, you're also working on the commentary James, are you doing something similar with James, both preaching and writing, and is it to be your next Reform Free Publishing Association book? The answer to the first question is yes. I am preaching now a series on James. In fact, the last sermon I preached in my congregation before we left for the British Isles and for Belfast was the last verse of James 5, so I have right. completed my series on James. Uh, in answer to your second question, yes, although I don't think it will be the next work that's published because I am at present deeply involved to and committed to manual of church history for which our high school teachers who teach church history have been clamoring for and have badgering, have been badgering me to work something that would be a reformed view of church history. So I'm devoting most of my time to that. So James perhaps 2013? <laughs> I don't think so. The work on a manual of church history is an enormous task. If I had known how enormous it was, I might not have taken it up. I think it will take at least another year to get that manual finished. I have the assistance of the teachers in our high schools, three of them, and they have promised to give me the benefit of their critiques because they're looking at it from the viewpoint of teaching it. But even with their help, it's an enormous task. I have the manuscript completed in the original, the first draft of revision, and revision again. You know, many years ago, in Time Magazine, there appeared a, an essay that stayed with me all my life. The essay was, How to Write Well. And it was a very informative essay. But at the beginning, at the end, the author said, I can really sum up the rules for good writing in three simple rules. Rule one, revise. Rule two, revise again. And rule three, do it a third time. <laughs> I found that to be true. 
Well, we're looking forward to reading your commentary on James, and if it's anything like this fine commentary on Galatians, we're not disappointed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor.